coming up on Network Africa. African Union suspends Sudan following coup. Sudan's supposed civilian leader returns home but remains under heavy security. Plus, doctors, state oil workers joined civil disobedience movement against Sudan military takeover. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenny Ola Shoboale. We begin with the situation in Sudan following Monday's coup. The African Union has suspended the country from all of its activities until the civilian-led transitional authority is restored, saying the coup was unconstitutional. The continental body also says it will undertake a mission to Sudan to engage with all stakeholders with a view to find an amicable solution to the political stalemate in the country. On Monday, General Commander of Sudanese Armed Forces, Abdul Fattah al burhan declared a state of emergency across the country, dissolved the Transitional Sovereign Council and the government, and relieved the state governors. Paul Abla Hamdok, the deposed Prime Minister of Sudan, has been allowed to return home, according to his office, after the country's military detained him after seizing power in a coup. The release of Hamdok and his wife follows international condemnation of General Abdul Fattah al burhans power grab. Earlier, the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, said he spoke on the phone to the Prime Minister following his return home. He again urged the armed forces to free civilian leaders. Meanwhile, anti-military protesters took to the streets overnight, burning tires and mounting barricades. Sudanese protesters built burning barricades overnight as they took to the streets for another day in protest against the military takeover that saw the detention of several civilian ministers and politicians. Monday's military takeover brought a halt to Sudan's transition to democracy, two years after a popular uprising toppled long-ruling Islamist autocrat Omar al-Bashir. Sudan's armed forces chief defended the military's seizure of power, saying he'd ousted the government to avoid civil war, while protesters took to the streets to demonstrate against the takeover after a day of deadly clashes. Demonstrators on the streets of Khartoum said they were blocking roads in protests they'd organized themselves in the absence of a political leadership. They also said that a mass protest against the military takeover is scheduled for October 30th. The people are mobilizing themselves because there is no internet, no phone communications, nobody's leading us, not the Freedom and Change Forces or the Professional Association. The people in the streets are leading themselves. We are not removing the barricades because General Bohan's speech was not convincing. We will protest on October 30th. Uh, Up until now, no one understands the situation. The revolutionaries continue to be in the streets. This is civil disobedience. We are waiting for the leadership on the ground to at least explain to the people what is going on. Because Burhan says this is not a coup and that this is a reservation of the constitutional document. This is unacceptable and we do not understand it. Speaking at his first news conference since announcing the takeover, General Abdel Fattah al burhan said the army had no choice but to sideline politicians who were inciting against the armed forces. Borhan said the military's action did not amount to a coup, as the army had been trying to rectify the path of political transition. He promised to appoint ministers chosen from each city that will be pre-approved from the people of each city. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok, who was ousted and detained on Monday, has been returned to his home. According to officials, he is there with his wife and is being heavily guarded. The release of Hamdok and his wife on Tuesday followed international condemnation of General Abdul Futa al-Burhan's power grab. 
The United States has said it will suspend aid, while the European Union has threatened to do the same. In the meantime, demonstrations against the military takeover are continuing for a third day in the capital, Khartoum, with trade unions representing doctors and oil workers joining the protest. Sudanese men, women and some children were seen demonstrating next to cars, clapping and chanting down with the military regime and free protesters. Thousands of people have taken to the streets since Monday's takeover and several have been killed in clashes with security forces. A group of neighborhood communities in the capital, Khartoum, has also announced plans for further protests leading to what it said would be a march of millions on Saturday. In the meantime, more reactions have been trailing the military coup in Sudan. The U.S. says it's looking at the full range of economic tools at its disposal to respond to the military takeover and has been in close contact with Gulf countries. The U.S. State Department has responded to the takeover by suspending $700 million in U.S. aid designed to support Sudan's democratic transition. Actually, we've been in close contact uh, with regional leaders, including in the Gulf, uh, to make sure that we're closely coordinating and sending a clear message uh, to the, uh, the military in Sudan that they should first and foremost uh, cease any violence against uh, innocent civilians, that they should release those who have been detained and they should get back on a democratic path. Uh, we will continue to do that. We'll stay closely coordinated and aligned with all of the stakeholders who we believe have influence in Khartoum. Second, we have made clear that we are deeply alarmed. Uh, President, uh, Secretary Blinken put out a very strong statement yesterday by the actions taken 36 hours ago by the Sudanese security forces, including the arrest of multiple civilian officials and the detention of Prime Minister Hamdok. We believe it undermines the country's transition to democratic civilian rule, and we firmly reject the assertions that this is within the authority of the military leadership in Sudan. Uh, from our perspective, these actions are utterly unacceptable. They contravene the constitutional declaration, but more importantly, they contravene the aspiration of the Sudanese people. The Secretary General will then take... Also condemning the action, you, the United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres says Sudan is among an epidemic of coup d'etats affecting Africa and Asia, and he urged the world's big powers to band together for effective deterrence through the UN Security Council. The Sudanese people has shown very clearly their intense desire for reform and democracy. Uh, now, we are seeing a multiplication of coup d'etats. Uh, the fact that we have strong geopolitical divides, the fact that the Security Council has lots of difficulties in taking strong measures, the impact of the problems of COVID uh, uh, and uh, the difficulties that many countries face from the economic and social point of view. Uh, these three factors are creating an environment in which some military leaders feel that uh, they have total impunity, they can do whatever they want, because nothing will happen to them. African Affairs Analyst uh, Dr. Okuyokpala joins us now for more on this. Dr. Okuyokpala, thank you uh, for joining us on the program. Very eventful developments in Sudan over the past couple of days. The AU has now suspended the country. What's your assessment of the situation so far? Uh, well, um, anybody planning to uh, in our 21st century 
we anticipate condemnations. They will even anticipate suspensions. But what they may not have anticipated, or, on, or rather, what they may have underestimated, is the resolve of the people. And the people of Sudan have mounted resistance against this scheme. The civil society have been very resolute. The politicians have not gone to negotiate for positions and for appointments. Even the prime minister have, have not been persuaded, have refused to be persuaded to release a statement somehow supporting the coup. That gives us hope. That gives hope that, well, um, things, uh, whatever is being done externally, that the people on ground, the Sudanese themselves, are showing that, look, we want democracy. We don't want disruptions of government in a violent manner. We don't want overthrow of government the way it has, I mean, the, 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 the current military leaders have done it. So, I mean, um, that gives a little, of course, even the responses they are having, the fact that they're able to, they, they have been, they initially, they, they were forced to come and give statement. They were forced to ask, I mean, release the prime minister from arrest and all that. Is I mean, a tribute to the determination of the people of Sudan. And that, that gives somehow consolation in all these matters. But with this uh, AU suspension and the World Bank also halting aid to the country, is this likely or is it enough to force the country back to civilian rule? Well, as, like I said before, I think any serious, any, any serious coup period that we anticipate some of this. However, a combination of internal and external pressure may likely make uh, make the uh, the few plotters and the and the and, uh, and the joint territory have a rethink and begin to plot their exit strategy, and then begin to negotiate how to save face and how to I mean uh, be able to uh, leave power without losing face. It but it is uh, AU or W or international organizations or even the. Is symbolic. It will help to put pressure externally, but if there is not, if, if we don't have enough internal pressure, that external pressure may not be enough to dislodge the. And you know, speaking of the pressure, uh, the U.S. says it's in talks with other Gulf countries to find a solution to this crisis. Overall, how much of a role do you think regional powers have in this? Yes, they have very serious role to. Play. Um, because it's like running a ring. We are covering every ground. Um, uh, every government, every even individuals, we need friends. And if you turn to the left and the I mean, if you if you notice that when you turn to the left, you are not seeing a friend. You are turn to the right, you are not seeing the, everybody telling you, look, I mean, we can't take this, we can't take this. And then there is no place to run to. Then you'll be forced to have everything. So, I mean, those countries that are traditional friends of Sudan, those countries that border, have sheer border with Sudan, they are, they are very instrumental in putting pressure. Those that are their trading partners, those that are giving them aids. So, I mean, they are, they are very important. However, It seems we lost Dr. Okuyopala there. Uh, Dr. Okuyopala, I don't know if you can hear me, um, but just very quickly, to pick on what we heard the UN chief say in there, uh, that Sudan is among an epidemic of coups in Africa and Asia, quite rightly, this is a worrying trend we're seeing more often, isn't it? Yes, very worrying. Because, you know, yeah, we, last just a few months ago, we were discussing Guinea. Previously, it was uh, it was Mali, and uh, there was one in Lima. That, and, and, uh, so, um, it's worrisome that we are beginning to reenact the 1980s when Q was happening every other month, or every every after uh, uh, very often. So, um, but then part of what is causing this is 
are not only successful crews. Apart, apart from successful crews, we are having instability in many countries, including our own country, Nigeria. We are having secessionists operating in, 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 in Cameroon. We are having um, Ethiopia being destabilized. It's worrisome. However, I think the, 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 for the world should come together to talk to leaders. Am, yeah. am I still on? Yeah, yes, okay. you are, sir. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, all the time we have now. You touched on some very interesting points there, uh, Dr. Okiokala. Thank you so much for your thoughts on the program. You're welcome. Or still to come on Network Africa. Cambridge University College and Paris Museum return looted African artifacts to Nigeria and Benin Republic. Please stay with us. Staying with us to Ethiopia's Tigray crisis, the United Nations says humanitarian access to the region remains challenging. The UN also says that avoiding violence in the country would require everyone involved to engage in a political dialogue. Turning to Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues there report that access to the northern part of the country remains challenging. As we've been mentioning repeatedly, people there need urgent humanitarian assistance. In Tigray, the humanitarian situation continues to deteriorate due to the restrictions imposed on the delivery of humanitarian supplies in the region via the only route, and that is through Afar, and that is the Semera Abala Mekele Road. Since October 18th, there's been no movement of convoys with humanitarian supplies in the region That's since October 18th. A reminder that an estimated 100 trucks with food, non-food items and fuel are required in Tigray daily to meet critical humanitarian needs. Fuel for the humanitarian response has not entered Tigray since August. 16 fuel tankers, each with a capacity of about 45,000 liters, remain idle in Samara. Due to the severe fuel shortages, many humanitarian partners have been forced to significantly reduce or suspend their activities. That includes food deliveries and water trucking. In addition to this, the suspension of the UN's humanitarian flights that follows last Friday's incident also means that much needed cash cannot be transported into Tigray. Meanwhile, marking this year's United Nations Day, the world body's top officials in Somalia have flagged some of the support being provided to and challenges faced in assisting Somalis on their path to peace and stability. The UN agency also reaffirmed its commitment in line with the organization's founding principles. The United Nations was created as a vehicle of hope for a world emerging from conflict. And now, 76 years later, it continues to serve the peoples of the world. Some of the challenges it was created to address have not changed, unfortunately. Conflict, poverty, hunger. At the same time, new challenges have arisen. COVID-19 and climate change, to name just two examples. Here in Somalia, the United Nations has been a steadfast partner of the country since its independence, dating back decades. And we expect the partnership with Somalia to continue across a wide range of areas in the future. The challenges we inherited from 2020, including the onset of COVID uh, and its devastating effect on the global economy, droughts and flooding, as well as the locust infestation, are sadly not yet behind us. According to some projections, as much as 20% of Somalia's population may be directly or indirectly affected by the pandemic. However, according to the World Bank report, the country's economy is expected to rebound from these shocks, with real domestic product um, projected to grow by about 2.4% this year. Nevertheless, it has uh, some way to go. Somalia's domestic revenue was 13% lower in the first quarter of 2021. This achievement has set the foundation for sustainable development of water resources in the country. This is particularly important as climate change is increasingly seen as a driver of conflict and requires holistic solutions to prevent disaster. A national task force on droughts and floods 
has now been launched as well and will lead nexus-centered interventions to reduce the negative impact of climatic shocks. Somalia's crises are multifaceted, and they therefore require multifaceted holistic solutions that build resilience against future shocks. Now, dozens of people have died in the past few weeks in the Republic of Benin from flood-related incidents, and that's according to the International Federation of the Red Cross. It says in a situation report that about half of the country have been affected by the heavy rains. Homes, schools, and other infrastructure, including bridges, have been damaged or destroyed by the floods with rains intensifying in the past two weeks. Significant agricultural and livestock losses have also been recorded because of the floods. The IFRC says the situation could get worse as water from the Nabeto Hydroelectric Dam on the Mono River, which runs near the border with Togo, is likely to be released in the coming days. More rains are also forecast until the end of the month. Now, the master of a Cambridge University college has described the return of a looted bronze cockerel to representative of Nigeria as a momentous occasion. The statue was taken by British colonial forces in 1897 and given to Jesus College in 1905 by the father of a student. A decision for it to be returned was made in 2019 after students campaigned. A ceremony was held at the college to sign the handover documents. Meanwhile, a Paris museum will also hand back cultural artifacts that were looted from modern-day Benin during the colonial era, setting a precedent that will pressure other institutions to return stolen works. In a ceremony to be presided over by French President Emmanuel Macron, the Choir Branly Museum will hand over to the Republic of Benin 26 artifacts that were stolen from the Kingdom of Abomey in 1892. There are among 5,000 works requested by the West African country. The handover marks a milestone in the years-long fight by African countries to recover works looted by Western explorers and colonizers at a time when numerous European institutions are grappling with cultural legacies of colonialism. Some 90% of Africa's cultural heritage is believed to be in Europe. The Quiet Branley Museum in Paris alone holds some 70,000 African objects. London's British Museum holds tens of thousands more. And finally on the program, the towering trees in Gabon's impenetrable mangrove swamps have helped to make the Central African country one of the world's few net observers of carbon as the plant sequestered the greenhouse gas four times faster than forests on land. Let's take a look. As the world struggles to curb climate change and UN talks on the issue to begin at the end of the month, countries such as Gabon are trying to work out exactly how much carbon is locked in their mangrove. Gabon only began to realize the full extent of its mangrove in 2018 when a study in the journal Nature Geoscience used satellite imagery to discover some of its trees were more than 65 meters high. That's taller than the Sydney Opera House, making them the world's tallest mangrove. Anything like this, then we have to measure the height. So when we work on the frail, we do not uh, incorporate the values for mangrove because we do not have really a lot of information on the mangrove forest compared to the terra firma forest. And so for us, it's just a reason. You know. But the recommendation for the technical assessment team for the UNCC is to add mangrove into that. And so we are working on it. But he insists the mangroves need to be looked after to avoid large releases of carbon into the atmosphere. The mangrove ecosystem 
we have really to be careful about them, not to destroy them, because if you destroy the mango system, then we will emit a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. In the last 20 years, mangroves have recovered from being one of the world's fastest shrinking habitats to one of the best protected, with over 40% in a conservation center. A July report by a coalition called the Global Mangrove an alliance found. Andrea Minque, the manager of Abotorom Ruponda Walker, located just outside Libreville, oversees a team of rangers who monitor the reserves to discourage people from destroying the plant to build houses or tourism businesses. We are hoping that with time, people will understand more and more the importance of mangroves. Because I always say in my talks, if we destroy all those mangroves, if we destroy all the forest, water will replace it. If we want to build, we will build on water. If we want to do agriculture, everything will be drowned. So it will be more important to maintain the mangroves. If we destroy it, what are we going to eat? Because that's where fish reproduces. Mangroves are found in over 100 countries. Those that lack monitoring capacity can use an online map and data platform called Global Mangrove Watch. It sends out alerts in near real time when it picks up signs of disturbance. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyola Shaboali.